Okay, joining us in the after hours now is uh, Raul. That's, um, it was such a great story, the Tales from the Trading. I don't know if I'm going to be able to kind of make anything, get anything better from you, but let's give it a try anyways. <laughs> um, so Raul, um, I know I saw you, and I just have to ask you one question. I, I, I saw you were getting married. I think you were talking about that on Real Vision. Is that correct? That's right. I am getting remarried, actually. So I've been married once before. But I, right. I, I met a girl on Little Cayman, which is an island of 140 people. Uh, so it's a bizarre <laughs> place for me to meet a life partner. But we are getting married. We're getting married in the desert outside Marrakesh in Morocco uh, in a week's time. Oh, oh, well, that's terrific. Congratulations. That's, uh, that's an awesome story. Thank you. Yeah. I like a bit of a um, travel and adventure. So, that's, so travel and adventure is kind of in my blood. So doing it in, in Marrakesh sure. was an extraordinary place. will be a lot of fun. How did you choose uh, Little Cayman? You mentioned that you know you you moved from Spain and you decided you were going to buy some uh, U.S. dollar denominated real estate. And how did you choose there? Um, as all good stories start, I was on a dive boat in the Galapagos <laughs> when I met. Um, I was on a shark diving trip in the remote air- islands of the Galapagos when I met a bunch of people who lived in Cayman, and I had been in a global in a search for years. For tropical beach I, you know i spent a lot of time going around the world diving with sharks and just diving in general and and i was always i love the tropics i love the mediterranean and i love the tropical turquoise sea and i always had that dream and so i was in a fortunate enough situation that i thought yeah i could probably go and do this so i've been searching for years and i happened to be on that dive but they said cayman islands I'm like, no it's not really for me it's a bit suburban it's a bit kind of a uh, more kind of u.s orientated and then they said well you might like little cayman and Little Cayman's entirely different. I mean, it is a feels like a remote island, but it's an hour's flight from Miami. And there is 140 people, perfect nature, an extraordinary piece of beach. And I'm looking out the window now at the, the, the huge French doors here, and it's just there's nothing else in sight. I've just got white sand beach, nature, turquoise sea, and in the far distance is the island of Cayman Brac. So, and, and so, do you have your do you have your own boat that gets back and forth, or do you have to go on uh, some sort of ferry? Yeah, no, there's a, it's 90 miles from the mainland, so there's... Oh, it's that flights. far. Oh, I didn't realize yeah. that. So it's four or five flights a day. Um, on There's a little twin otter, a 1960s twin otter, which is like the Land Rover of the skies. Fantastic yeah. little thing, and uh, you just pop over, it takes 30 minutes. So it's actually pretty easy. Oh. Ah, I didn't realize that. I believe that twin otter, that's a Canadian uh, plane. Yes, I think it is. Yeah, and that's, I think that they... Plane. I think like 90% of them that were ever built are still in operation. Exactly. I mean, they're like Land Rovers. You can't, you can't, you just can't get rid of them. You know, you can just fix them with a, with a spanner and a bit of tape. <laughs> Which is kind of a little scarier when it's your plane, but, uh, <laughs> um, okay. So rules. So I'm going to ask you some questions here. If you were, um, could go back in time and tell a young Raul, which, uh, what, you know, what to, he should do differently. What would you tell him? Nothing. No, I wouldn't. I literally wouldn't do anything differently because life is a journey of making failure is part of the journey and making mistakes is all part of it. And I think you don't become the person you are today without all the mistakes that you've made in the past. So, you know, I I wouldn't change anything. I've been really lucky and I've had highs and lows and like everybody else. But in the end, it's been a fantastic journey and I wouldn't change anything. Oh, that's a very Zen like comment. Uh I must say, good for you. So how about this? How about then, what would you tell a young kid that's uh, interested in the markets today, you know, whether they want to be a portfolio manager or trader? You know, obviously, it's a lot different than back then when you when you started. What, what advice do you give to young people today? Um, so I have a lot of people reaching out to me saying, you know, I want to get into this. How do I think about it? How do I get into a hedge fund? And my advice is always the same as don't. Um, really? Our, yeah, our business has changed. There is, it is a shrinking industry, so you're fighting head structural headwinds. You know, the largest pool of capital on earth is gradually leaving the market, which is the baby boomers. It's not going to be up, offset by the millennial generation. So you've got a structural change in financial markets. Go and ask anybody who ever worked in the financial markets in Tokyo about what that means, or even in Europe. It means a slow, miserable death. So that industry, I don't think, is a good industry. I think, as you talked about, the, yeah, it's difficult for time horizon, a number of different things, even for people to get into the hedge fund industry, which is shrinking dramatically. 
I always say, if you do, if you're, if you want to take risk and you want to see patterns and see the world and figure out how to do things, go and start a business. That's the real opportunity. If you want to have a bet, then think about the future of the world doesn't lie in what we know. Um, it lies in probably digital assets and the trading and understanding of what the massive impacts that has on the future of finance and not in the obvious ways of, you know, the rise of Bitcoin or whatever else, cryptocurrencies. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the ability to trade assets will will will, will change everything. Even, for example, what we understand a corporation today to be doesn't need to exist in the future. So the reason we have corporations, the word corporate is because it makes it like a human body, i.e. it has a human entity, which means you can sue it, you know, that kind of thing. So to using new fractional ownership and the tokenization of assets, which is where the world is going to, a company like Exxon doesn't have to be a corporation. It can be a large amalgamation of streams of income or streams of assets, uh, of which you can you can choose portfolios of parts of, some of, all of, etc. So the all or nothing approach to how we look at things now will go. So even because of the ability, and we're already seeing on sports stars and other people, and the music industry, I think even Bowie pretty much started this with the Bowie bonds, is people can also sell off parts of their future income streams via tokenization. And it means that anybody can own a share of the most expensive building in the world or the most expensive car. So everything becomes a digital asset with recorded ownership. And therefore, we have an enormous new set of things that we can trade and invest in because we can invest in pretty much anything. That really changes the overall landscape. And we're not there yet. But in the next 20 years, even if you hear how Mark Carney and the um, the ECB have been talking about uh, kind of a digital stable currency. The world is going this way. Things are changing super fast. And so, you know, I think anything that we are looking at now, how we trade, how we think of investing, I think is going to change. So if you want to do it, be in that part of the industry. If you really want to take risk, make money and earn a future income that is an outsized return, start a business. So um, given that um, attitude, you know, does does that mean that you believe that the next reserve currency most likely won't be a currency at all? Depends what we mean by currency. Again, I'm well, not, not a, a yeah, yeah, like yeah. not a nation's currency, but like a, a, some sort of cryptocurrency of some sort, an electronic well, I think, form. I think the most likely outcome first is some form of this stable coin. So if you think of there are stable coins that people may have heard of, like Tether. They're not stable coins. They're basically U.S. dollar pegs. But the stable coin that Libra, that Facebook came up with, was clever. The reason being is it's because it was dollars plus the other currencies. So everything else normally is a basket of currencies versus the dollar. But this wasn't. So if you do it that way, then basically that currency, if you think of it as a basket of all currencies, including dollars, and you could throw gold and you could throw Bitcoin, whatever it is in that basket – will only go up and down with global money supply. So now you've traded, created something that is very different. So it acts truly like a fiat currency or even like, dare I say, Bitcoin, because money supply, stock flow becomes the most important part of the equation. So now if all governments can be part of that, then there is going to be a move towards seeing how stable you can get your currency. And the, and the argument will be you're better to go to a... a um, cryptocurrency that has a formula in terms of money supply. So then you don't have to manage your own currency. So you put it into the stable basket, all world trade goes onto stable coin and your own currency remains stable against it works pretty well. Um, so I think that is certainly part of the answer. Um, and it won't be Libra, but it's very clear that they let the genie out of the bottle. It means that the central banks are in a fight now to get launch something, I think. And that's what Mark Carney and the ECB have just told you. The dollar system they have to walk away from. Um, so that's interesting in itself. But it also means that anybody in the private sector can set up a, a global currency basket of the same form, you know, the stable coin. That in itself okay. is an interesting thing because then who issues currency? What is currency? There's a nation state to pay taxes currency, but there's also a trading currency 
okay, we're in a different world already now. And then you've got maybe a global reserve currency, which could be Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin, wh why do I say that? It's just because that, as it increases in value, it, it has a, it's decentralized. So it has certain value within a digital system, which nothing else can have. It has a collateral value because it can't be, um, you know, it can't be inflated away. So it's too, far too early to think in these terms yet, but at some point it will stabilize massively because it reaches its actual real market cap will be something closer to probably global money supply. And over time, therefore, you actually have a competitor to the global monetary system. So, I, you know, and again, I'm, I'm just thinking big picture. None of us knows this stuff. You know, I'm not person pounding the table saying this is definitely going to happen, but I can see the steps to get there. The kind of knock on effects are happening. And when I first got into Bitcoin, I saw that bit pretty early, not the moving parts, but that this was an answer to something different. Yeah, actually, you mentioned getting into Bitcoin early. I seem to remember you. You said $200. I thought I remember a GMI uh, report that was the first time I'd actually heard of you um, where it was at $100. Am I wrong? I, mean, I thought you. I, I think I, you know, I think it was $200 or maybe I bought okay. it time at 200 Maybe I wrote about it a bit earlier. But that yeah. piece is I wrote about it and basically before most other people, I just thought, okay, how the hell do we value this thing? I understand right. what it might be. So I just said, listen, the only way I can think of this is if, if it's supposed to be some sort of digital gold, which was an idea at the time, and it still is one of the ideas of what this thing could be, I just said, well, we'll just, we'll just impute what it looks like versus the kind of above ground supply versus known reserve underground supply of gold and do the same to Bitcoin. And I got the valuation with Gold roughly here at like thirteen hundred, fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred dollars. Bitcoin should have been worth a million. Yeah, um, and you and you came out and said, listen, even if you discount that for the probability that it works, it still you know easily goes to ten thousand or something was your number. And yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story about my Bitcoin experience. Um, I had a young smart guy beside me that was a computer engineer, and he told me about Bitcoin at five dollars. I wow. listened to him explain it, and I and I told him that was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard, <laughs> and that he should just not did not talk about that anymore. And he says, you know, a couple months later, he says to me, you know, that thing that was five dollars is now fifty dollars. And I thought to myself, well, it's fifty dollars. It could be five hundred or five thousand. And I couldn't bring myself to buy it, but I basically said, well, how do you make these? And I got to know it, and we ended up having our own little Bitcoin farm in our office. Really? We were buying butterfly machines and we were like, you know, mining them. And then I'm actually uh, at my kind of first job on an institutional desk. I was, uh, I was an institutional equity derivatives trader, but I also did a lot of computer work. We did a lot of computerized trading. So I was one of the first to write what's uh, like an interlisted R between the U S and Canadian stock exchanges. So I would like re research in motion would be listed in both. So I would just arb the two. So I realized that the same thing could be done in Bitcoin. So we wrote that and we made all this money. So it went from, and then I saw your piece and, and you kind of, to me was you were like the first serious thinker I'd ever seen that had talked about the fact that it could go up. And so I think that first rally, it went to a thousand bucks and we wrote it, we were arbing it, we were mining it, we did great. And then it fell to 200 bucks. And I thought to myself, okay, that's it. That was the greatest bubble of like, uh, cause I, I'm a little more of a skeptic than you are. I said, it's a great bubble. It's terrific. I mean, we made this money and I, we sold all of our machines and I never thought about it again. And I never imagined that it would kind of come back here and be here. And that I, little did I realize that the real, you know, big move was still ahead of us. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I fell out of love with Bitcoin when in that 2017 rally. And I was like, look, I don't understand what this forking is, what's going on, all these different tokens and these new currencies. I'm like, this looks like, you know, you're competing away to zero and there's too much competition and nobody's going to know what. And people, people like Mark Hart said, you're wrong. They said that there, there, there will only be one real competitor out of this and there'll be a few smaller ones. But, you know, there's not one competitor. There's only going to be one and Bitcoin will beat them all. I'm like, I don't really believe that. And then, and then after the, the, bub, the inevitable bubble and then the sell-off, I started to realize that all the others had basically gone to zero. You know, there's a few of the others like Ethereum that have some proven right. value. And then Bitcoin was like 
st- still at two hundred billion dollar market cap. And right. it was then at that point there was a guy called Dan Tapiero, who's another kind of um, macro friend of mine who worked for everybody from from Tiger to Steinhardt to Stan Druckenmiller. He he's bugging me every other day saying, and there's a lot going on in currency markets and fixed income markets. So I, I'm like, he keeps bugging me saying, "Well, look at Bitcoin." I'm like, Dan, I'm no interest. You know, there's too much going on. And he keeps tapping on the shoulder every two days. And eventually I sat down and talked to him on Real Vision. And I realized he basically changed my mind to realize, okay, this is so much bigger than I ever thought about. Uh, I didn't quite understand how big this was. And, you know, just the problem, it's just, if you just think of it as an option on a new system, then that's the easiest way to think of it. Because it's almost impossible to understand where it's actually going and what it is, because it's a lot of things. Right. Okay. So we're going to get one last question. You've been very generous with your time and we're going to ask one last question. I want to kind of talk about you. You mentioned Twitter and how you're, you're, you are very giving on Twitter. You talk a lot and you, and you answer many people's questions. And I must say that I have, uh, you've treated me like the, the greatest gentleman, like when I was a little bit of a bond bear and in that, uh, that rally when everyone was doing kind of victory laps, you were very quick to kind of come to my defense and say, listen, everyone trades differently. And you have to remember that the, that it, the market has a way of making fools of all of us. And I do appreciate it. it was very kind of you. Um, but one of the things that I see is that not everyone's as kind to you. And I've noticed that over, over the years, some people have taken to kind of showing the bad trades and uh, kind of bringing them to everybody's light. And, and we all have bad trades. And I just want to kind of get your like kind of feeling about why Twitter seems to bring out the worst in many people. And I, I've noticed this as well. Yeah. It just, it just, it's both a terrific, unbelievable place and a, an awful place at the same time. Yes. And I, I find some of that stuff, you know, you can ignore. Um, I find that Twitter was really led by the kind of community leaders. So if we're all good to each other, then people learn. And they start policing themselves. And that's an amazing thing that happens now. Mainly, there's a lot on FinTwit. There are some people who are just, people who have a huge following are just snarky and undermining of everybody and everything. And there's a, there's a few of them, and I won't mention their names, but I, you know they make my Twitter experience extremely unpleasant because of what they're like. Um, and they're kind of like schoolyard bullies. And they're the schoolyard bullies of Twitter where they're always kind of thinking they're smarter than everybody, sneering at people. And, you know, as you and I know, if you've actually got skin in the game, you have humility because we are not right most of the time. You know, we try to be right as much as we can. And you have to understand that this game is is about we're all trying to figure this out. Nobody's trying to ram anything down each other's throats. It's not a competition of me versus you. It's you and I trying to think aloud on Twitter and share our views and and we'll you know sometimes we get it right sometimes we get it wrong and we have different time horizons so somebody will have said yeah. see i was right made a fortune in the bond market by shorting it in the last two weeks yes right you have i am still up a lot in the bond market and i've given back some in the last two weeks it's all part of the same thing so right. i don't so that's what i don't i don't like community leaders who are snarky and kind of subtweet people and do all of that stuff i think they're just dicks and they ruin the entire environment um yeah and the other thing I, I'm, I'm actually shocked about, I don't know if it's a, a function of us growing up on a trading desk, but why do people think that I want to convince everyone of my views? If everyone felt the way I did, I would have nobody to trade with. I welcome other people's views because I need somebody to be on the other side of my trades. That, that's right. And exactly right i mean <laughs> our job is not to persuade everybody but people think it is and so therefore they're like yeah. well you, you're never going to persuade me i'm like i don't care whether i persuade you but i'd love to have a chat with why you think i might be different why why the it, outcomes might be different than i think that's great yeah i i 100 percent agree and, but i i have a line that i say meet you in the machine because when we used to have a disagreement on the trading desk we'd both go into the machine and we'd have a trade and it was something that it was it was great when we disagreed because it meant we had a trade that's right. And, you know, there was a the one that really upset me the most is 
and it's it's because people only see many people on Twitter only see th- things through their perspectives. So recently, I think it was Joe Wiesenthal, who tends to be one of the Twitter bullies, um, is trying to call me out for about the End Game, the 2012 presentation that I gave to the Morgan Stanley Hedge Fund Conference in Shanghai, where I talked about the risk of Europe completely imploding. Now, 2012, if you remember, that was the Eurozone crisis. And I was joining the dot saying, if this happens, this happens, then we're going here. So that wasn't leaked to anybody. I didn't leak it. Somebody got the presentation, gave it to the press. It went around, became the largest read financial article in internet history at the time. And that was nothing to do with me. It had a life of its own. Um, So I wasn't trying to use it to gather attention. But anyway, by the end of it, as we know, the markets collapsed over that period, and and um, but eventually Draghi saved the day, and we got away with what most people would say, well, it was all okay. Why were you predicting doom? And this is the problem with something like that, is people have a very short memory. At that time, I was living in Spain. Youth unemployment hit 50%. Friends of mine, like a third of my friends, living in a beach town in Spain, went bankrupt. It was an extraordinary time. Um, the, the ECB gave forced Spain to take $10 billion to prop up their banking system because we were going to lose all the banks. Friends of mine were getting bailed in by the banking sector, essentially, because they turned deposit accounts into preference shares and then basically written them off to zero. So people were losing their deposits. People didn't know where to go. I had to get cash in the house and get a generator because I thought we were going to lose electricity. Meanwhile, Cyprus entirely shut down i mean everybody's life savings anybody had over 100 grand including every business lost all of their money as the ecb bailed in the banking system so all of that went on there was the you know there were rioting in the streets all across europe and then people call you out on twitter and go see the world didn't end i'm like are you fucking kidding me (laughs) (laughs) it's the Um, it's the lack of context people have that it is extraordinary yeah, and it, it to me it's also that both sides are bad. The the bulls that that are feeling smug that everything's great, and the bears that are co- convinced that the world is going to end all the time. And I just try to be a little more pragmatic about the whole thing. And I agree with you. I'm always like I welcome people telling me information about why I might be wrong. I love to hear the other side of it. But if you're just going to attack me and tell me what an idiot I am, like I just very quickly find that, that like it just becomes so boring and so uh, it, it ruins Twitter for me. And it, it yeah, is, it's, it's unfortunate. I, have, I find the same. I mean, the other group I don't like uh, on Twitter, actually the, 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 the crypto crowd has got better. They were really bad for a while. But the one that's very smug, is the social justice warrior Twitter that's generally bleeded out of gold Twitter and has, you know, gone to gone to Tesla and every stock's a fraud. And, you know, it's, yeah. um, you know, there are some really extraordinary, amazing short sellers who are on Twitter. And then there's a bunch of these tourists who have gone yeah. on to this. They've become so, social justice warriors and they're, they're, they're just bullies. Yeah. So, you know, some poor I don't guy, know how any... Go on. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I don't know... What they get out of, you know, bullying some person who's got a different view on Tesla than, than them. Yeah, the guy, they may be wrong. Tesla may be going to zero. It may not be. But, but they, they're hunting in packs at people. And I just think it's – and the Tesla <laughs> yeah. people are equally as bad. The bulls are equally as bad. And it's just like, yeah. really, guys, this is just playground stuff. I think that anybody who's sure about anything – like that, like with that sort of certainty, you have to ignore because I'm the first one to tell you, I don't know. I can give you my odds of it. And my whole job is to try to figure out points where the market is mis um, underestimating or overestimating the odds of something happening. And, and that's all I care about is, is the market correct about assigning the probabilities correctly? And I'm just looking for differences. And so I don't understand why you have to believe I'm always bullish, I'm always bearish. No, I'm just looking for opportunities. And I find these people that where it's a religion, whether it be bull's religion, bear religion, or whatever, it's just, it just ends up making Twitter a, a smaller place instead of a bigger place. That's right. And it, it creates tribalism as well. And I don't like the yeah. tribalism elements. I mean, I, I much like people who change their minds, who shift. Now, 
you know, there's this whole periods of time where because where the business cycle is, people are going to be one way round. Um, but people don't bother exploring that view. They just think that that's what they always are. So it's a yeah, it's a weird world. I don't. I, I find Twitter one of the most amazing resources I've ever had. I almost don't use any other source of news any longer, and I don't read anybody else's research. I uh, never really have, but but Twitter makes it amazing because I get a bunch of people I trust you know, that I've curated, and I can get their opinion. So if I want to know what you're thinking, Kevin, I can just go to your Twitter feed. I can see that you'll chip into a discussion we're having, and whether you've got the same view as me, a different view, or you come up with something I didn't even think about, wasn't even looking at. And that's a, so powerful. Oh, I agree. It's a, it's like a trading desk. I always tell kids like um, I'm a little more bullish about um, the 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 industry going forward. I'm hopeful that the uh, that this move from uh, com- computerized trading or from regular traders down to computerized trading is almost fully complete, and that maybe going forward we're gonna the 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 industry will adapt and go forward. And I always tell kids that uh, that are interested in the industry. I said first thing you need to do is get on Twitter because there are an amazing amount of people there, really smart people that I didn't have access to that now all of a sudden I can see what they think. Like you're on there. I love the Haynes and Key. Uh, what's that? Hayek and, um, uh, Hayek Hayek and Keynes, Keynes yeah. there. He, he's awesome. Like, and these guys are, they're, they're people that have backgrounds that previously were just unheard of that they would share it. You know, like you were lucky enough to talk to all those, you know, great uh, hedge fund greats throughout the years. But now all of a sudden, and your real vision is another example. Yeah. You know, all the, like it's, it's your, I think you use the word democratizing like finance. And I, and exactly I, right. I, I agree. I agree. And Twitter, because Twitter they does go, that, right? I can get access. Yeah. We would have never have met if it wasn't for Twitter. So, for sure. you know, I would have yeah. never have met most of the people I now know in the finance world if it wasn't for Twitter. Um, which yeah. is unbelievable. And Real Vision is just the part of that same process, but I get to hear what's on your mind for half an hour or an hour. Well, yeah. I'm never going to get that chance unless I manage to get in front of you at some point, sit down and have a talk. But this is incredibly powerful, where we get to hear for everybody's minds what they think is going on it's, and where the opportunity lies or where the risk lies. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, no, it is terrific. Anyways, I just want to thank you for Real Vision because it's, uh, for me, it's been part of my learning experience and uh, I, I enjoy it all the time. And uh, I'll just kind of give, I'll say one last time, if you haven't gone and checked it out, do you, do you offer a free trial? I can't remember. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a free trial. There's, it, there's a free trial and there's also a yep. free version of it. It has a lot less content, but just go, go to the website and just, you know, knock your socks off, go and look at the content and you'll end up subscribing because I think it's like 63% of everybody who even takes a free trial ends up subscribing because they love it. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, and uh, you can, I've been a subscriber for a long time and I'm a big fan and I just want to thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you on and I want to wish you all the best in your wedding next week. Thank you very much. I lo- really enjoyed the <laughs> podcast as well. Really enjoyed the chat. It was good fun. Thanks again. Take care. Cheers.